All right. So today is Tuesday, April 19. We've got an absolutely fantastic room in store for all of us. Uh, the topic is credit. I was talking with Bobby J earlier this morning about, um, we should call this credit for dummies or something like that. Credit's one of those funny things that for dumb equity guys like myself, you know you're supposed to pay attention to it, but you're not quite sure how. And it's one of those things where it doesn't matter until it matters. There was a great meme the other day. I think I retweeted it out. It showed one person sneaking up on another person. The guy behind was credit and the person being snuck up upon was equity. And, you know, credit's highest in the capital structure. So, um, you know, what happens in credit has an amplified effect in uh, equity world. The thing is, we've been in this world flooded with liquidity where it's almost as if there hasn't been a credit cycle because all credit has been good. That's what happens when you make the cost of money zero. Well, I think the tide is starting to go out, albeit slowly, maybe it's not as rapidly as I would like, but we're going to learn a lot more about today, uh, today from uh, Bobby J and um, his good friend, Marty Fritzen. So Bobby, um, I'd like you to come up here and make you a co-host, make you a speaker. And uh, Marty Fridson will be joining us shortly as well. Today was an interesting day. Uh, what caught my attention, not so much the equity action. Um, yeah, it's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. The market has really no institutional memory from one day to the next. But what I thought was really interesting, what was going on in um, fixed income land, in particular, with respect to the JGBs and uh, the yen, I didn't see where the yen went out. Uh, I was out, but this morning it was, you know, well through 128. JGB yields were uh, been a bit on a tear to the upside. And there was a great uh, Twitter thread that I forwarded, um, or I'm not sure I did forward it. Anyway, go look at Jim Bianco's Twitter thread. He talks about what's going on in Japan and the um, it's a very good explanation what's going on in Japan and the attempt at yield curve control and um, what effect that's having on the, the JGB market and in turn the yen. You can control one or the other, but not both. And given that Japan is the world's largest or second largest creditor, what happens in Japan reverberates everywhere. So when you see, you may say, well, what difference does it make? Japanese yields going from, you know, negative whatever to a small negative whatever to a small positive whatever well the whole global yield curve gets impacted by that and that's a huge deal and so again bianco let me see if i can find it here he was he was uh, talking about how what's happening in japan uh, reverberates reverberates everywhere and so for a lot of people that are macro unaware or alternatively are just looking domestically Given that the world's a pretty small place and you've got this interlink interlinkage between all of the various areas and, and m money's fungible, money flows. So stay tuned. Um, you know, people can be arguing what's going on with the U.S. economy and it's slowing or it's not slowing. Um, but I think there's a huge regime shift taking place. We've been talking about that constantly. I still believe that's the case. I continue to want to take the over on uh, oil prices, interest rates and the dollar. And that's not a happy cocktail for risk assets. So, Michael K., can you hear me? Hey, George. How are you? Hey, good to see you. Good, good, good. I'm going to give you the stage for a couple of minutes to talk about your latest thoughts. People always love to hear what you've got to say, but just uh, just a couple of minutes while Bobby J. and, and, and Marty Fritz and uh, you could be the, Bobby, I know you're there, but let's just let Michael talk for a minute or two. Michael, what, what sort of catches your eye the last couple of days, Michael? Um. You know, every day the market goes up a little bit and cyclicals catch a bid. Everyone gets excited. And there's this idea I keep hearing that we've already priced in the slowdown, so it's now the time to price in the recovery, which is, I just think, the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. You know, if you look at every market bottom, it all happens near economic bottoms, earnings bottoms, and we're nowhere near that. Uh, and so it's just uh, kind of my latest thoughts, and some institutional clients are talking about, well, the slowdown's already been priced in. 
um, you know, everything's already priced in. So markets can only go up from here, which again, I think is ridiculous. I, I, I couldn't agree. I couldn't agree with you more, Michael. Um, there's such a narrative that gets this narrative du jour to fit whatever motive one has. By the way, I may have mentioned this the other day in the room. I don't recall if I did, but I'll repeat it. Um, I was having a meeting with um, a company that owns. And actually, Michael, you're a really good thinker, and, and I'd like you to think about this and give me your interpretation. But this actually would play into, I think, a lot of what you've been talking about. They, it's a large uh, producer of uh, consumer goods sourced out of Southeast Asia. I'm trying to be in particular. It's a consumer name brand that we all know. The name is unimportant. And he was explaining to me how the company is very bullish on the outlook because the orders they have right now are, you know, have been very good. Yep. But what you're already starting to see is they're already seeing it. I mean, it's a company like Weber Grill or like Traeger. It's, it's one of those type of things, okay? And what they're seeing is the or they, they already see real time the orders are falling. And what's happened the last you know year or two, their fixed costs have gone up enormously. Wages have gone up, I think I said in, in domestically in the U.S. from like 12 bucks an hour to 20 bucks an hour. So his concern is that they see the orders rolling already. Their fixed costs are up. Uh, many companies have hoarded raw materials, have hoarded inventories. So you got a situation where your fixed costs are up, your variable costs are up, and now the orders are falling away. And his view is you're going to be in a recession before the end of the year. Um, I, I, I'm going to guess that you kind of, that kind of fits with your narrative, but tell me, tell me your view of a scenario like that. Yeah. We're going to slow to like 1% GDP this year. And if you're growing at one, if the economy is growing at 1%, you have sectors in a recession, right? Cause that's just the average or the weighted average of the economy. And so these are not the days where we used to grow four or 5% and you'd slow to 3%. And most sectors of the economy would be fine, even or, or at worst, you know, stagnant, not contracting. And that's been kind of the story really since 08. Every time we slow, you end up with a handful of sectors in recession. And, you know, we, we all know, like, that's one great example of those sectors that are likely to be in that. And, and they're going to be in an earnings recession. Uh, it's a simple way to think about it. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, it's funny because I mean, I'm glad you use that term uh, earnings recession because people want to get into the whole, oh, it's it's a recession. It's not as at the end of the day, we're investing in stocks and stocks are a function of earnings and discount rates. So even if you yeah. go to a full blown recession, if you just slow to a real crawl and a lot of companies such as this consumer company I was mentioning face a margin squeeze. I mean, and then who knows if my part of the narrative is right as well, the bond yields go up. Maybe they don't. But don't you think we're likely to look, we're likely looking at a really pretty significant uh, earnings disappointments coming up? A thousand percent. Um, again, looking, if you took a snapshot of the global economic data right now, activity data, it's all still, it's all peaked and it's all off its peak. And it's starting to slow, whether you look at housing or manufacturing or whatever, it's all peaked and it's all, you know, a few months or a few quarters off its peak. But every leading indicator of these, all these series from housing to manufacturing, ultimately, which lead to profit revisions, are all pointing down for the next year and a half. You know, we're not talking about a month or two months. And every day we see rates go higher and commodities go higher. Again, the end of this story is a really ugly growth slowdown. And I know, George, you think rates are going to keep going up and oil keeps going up. God forbid, because the economy is just going to be in shambles in, in, in a year's time. Well, but, well, yeah. actually, actually, I, I consider you a friend, uh, Michael, so I'm going to say I'm going to tease you. OK, I should yeah. just take that call down, declare a victory. I mean, in the two months we've been talking about this, I, I do know the 10 years at 294 now. I agree. Rates will get to a level where they go down. But, you know, show, I mean, forget about the pushback I was getting. The rates are going to go higher. I mean, I don't even think I would have said it'd be 294 today. So. If this gets a lot to the uh, linkages and the plumbing of the global financial system. And I just think, you know, there's a, I mean, God forbid I me, mean, could you imagine do you take your scenario on earnings, which I, which I totally agree with and God forbid it's your worst nightmare. You take my scenario on rates like, hello. So I don't know, by the way, I have to interrupt. I have to interrupt. I am so excited. I am so excited. I just love these talking heads on FinTwit. Okay, and and what I and the, and, and the and the and the folks on the mainstream media, 
who engage in, um, you know, the, the, the soundbite du jour and the, the, the stockbroker economics. All right. So one of the ones, the soundbite du jour was the Ackman bottom. Well, what happens when the bottom falls out of the bottom? For all you folks paying attention there at home, Netflix, I see, is down 25% after hours. Um, gee, who could have who could have possibly thought that? So Kathy Wood, she may have missed that one. I don't know. But that whole crowd, that whole work from home, multiple expansion, major growth deceleration, negative operating leverage because their cost structures are going up. Hello. So I don't know, Michael, I, I kind of restrain myself, but. You know, I, you don't maybe you don't I, I don't want you to comment so much on Netflix per se because I know you have compliance issues. But generically, what do you say about that type of stock? Um, geez, I mean, there's there's so many stocks like that that just are not going to have momentum for uh, earnings momentum and revenue momentum for such a long period of time. You know, they kind of saturated the market last a year and a half ago, two years ago. Um, these long duration growth stocks, and I don't know if Netflix is still one of those, but these long duration, expensive, expensive, profitless growth stocks, I think are just dead money at best. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, you're very charitable. You have a real position. So, um, you know, if, if you're Michael K. unhinged and you're not, you're not responsible, maybe you sound more like yours truly. But I just go batshit crazy when I hear people like, and I'll restrain myself, Bill Ackman. You know, just talking crap, and it's just, and people follow him, and it's just, I, I don't know, this is enough said. By the way, the way we're going to run this room, it's a little different from the other rooms, it's going to be a conversation between uh, Bobby J and Marty. I will chime in from time to time. Michael, you chime in as well if you have some credit questions or whatever, but basically, Bobby J is going to be running the show here. So, Bobby J, the floor is yours. Uh, Bobby J, go ahead. Yeah, okay. So, I'm going to start off by, we, we have a lot of talk in the rooms and in the media about credit. Uh, and you sometimes you hear the term that the bond guys are smarter because they may see something happening that the equity guys don't see. And I don't know if that's true, but we do know that the fault lines in the system are always in credit land. And anytime we have a significant crisis or a mini crisis, it emanates from the credit space because that's where the leverage is and that's where it builds up and that's where it occurs. Um, it happened in 2007. It's happened in foreign crisis. Uh, it, it's happened um, in, um, in 2020 uh, when spreads start to blow out. So we need to be very mindful of credit. And today we're going to talk a little bit about what's going on in credit land and um, and the repercussions and what is the shape of the high yield market? What are default rates looking like? And one thing I want to point out, um, Marty, as background, I would say he is considered the number one uh, person in the field of high yield research, going back to when he was head of high yield strategy uh, and research at Merrill Lynch from 1989 to 2002. That's when I met him and George knows they had a, a great pantheon of uh, research there from Chuck Cloud to Rich Bernstein to Dick McCabe to Marty Fritzen. Uh, and they had quite a powerhouse of research uh, going on there. Um, and he is um, gone deep into the high, he took high yield into a quant perspective uh, into quant research. Before that, it was just a bunch of Drexel guys looking at charts and uh, reversion to the mean with credit spreads. And he put a science to it. He has written numerous books, including uh, Financial Statement Analysis, which is in his fifth printing. And it, it is a textbook for uh, being able to look at companies, understanding the financial statements. It's something that you should have on your desk whether you want to read it or just look smart because you have it there, it's your choice. But if you can't go through the CFA, this is the second best uh, choice that you have. Uh, his other books uh, include Investment Illusions, which is about popular misconceptions about the market uh, and how to avoid minefields, which is a, a theme that George um, works at constantly and has been a big uh, benefit to this room. Uh, Marty is currently the chief investment officer at uh, Lehman, 
Levian and Pritzen Advisors, and um, he contributes to S&P Global articles, uh, financial journals, and also he does a monthly newsletter through Forbes uh, with a subscription of $195 a year, and he talks about investing in um, rising rate environments. So, Michael, um, do you, you look at credit as one of uh, your inputs in looking at the financial landscape? Absolutely. Look at uh, high yield, uh, mostly investment grade spreads. Um, it's a great way to help explain changes in valuations for cyclical stocks. Simple rule of thumb, when spreads widen, cyclical valuations get hit. Doesn't matter if they're high, moderate, cheap, they go down. Uh, and vice versa. Uh, and usually spreads are widening when it's uh, when it's about an earnings slowdown. That's where cyclicals really get hit. And again, that's that's kind of our view. The next 12 months, we're going to have a spread storm uh, at some point that's going to hit all these cyclicals. Yeah, Michael. And to your point, which I think is ext- extremely important because it's in, it's important to see when something goes from a routine um, correction to something more serious beyond that. And that's when we need credit spreads to uh, indicate that. And um, it is, you know, it's, it's really when the problems start. But one thing I'd like to point out, we've been talking a lot about ARC and, and various funds in here. And I did a little um, dive into uh, the ARC portfolio. And one thing that jumped out at me is that the top holdings are rated below investment grade. And, we often talk in the room about growth versus value, long duration stocks, et cetera. But it also may be just a matter that this is the time to own higher quality, Michael. And I was wondering if if we had an ETF that was, say, single A stocks or better versus an ETF that has double B stocks or better, do you have any thoughts on the relative performance of something like that? And, and what do you think about the quality trade, rather growth versus value? Uh, I think, well, I think a simple way to think about that uh, is just looking at like large cap value to large cap, uh, sorry, large cap value to large cap, uh, small cap value, large caps doing better and large caps going to have higher quality than a small cap value. And then the same thing comparing large growth to small growth. Uh, it's not a perfect, it's not a perfect, uh, way to read it but uh, i think it, it'll, it'll do for the purposes of that now quality you know quality got hit in the first few months of this year because of the rates back up you know everyone threw out every growth stock whether it made money or didn't make money obviously the ones that didn't make money got hit harder but um yeah i agree qualities as this as the market narrative one of george's favorite words becomes more about earnings less about rates and higher oil uh which that's you know it's going to I think that'll evolve over the next 12, 15 months. Um, Quality is going to matter more and more and more. Yeah, so we can, uh, and by the way, if people want to check the quality on their portfolio, you can do that for free simply by going to Moody's, registering uh, on their website, and you can pull up the names there. And uh, in terms of the quality that was hit at the beginning, um, it was the growthier stocks, but it, it, it indeed was, you know, the Apple, which is triple A, obviously hasn't been hit the same way, uh, or J and J, which is triple A, hasn't been hit the same way as Tesla, which is um, double B. Uh, Netflix is double B and uh, Coinbase and all these other names. So uh, if you if you're a little nervous about your portfolio, in terms of quality, please check the credit rating on it because that will tell you uh, in a nutshell uh, how the agencies are viewing it in terms of cash flow, uh, debt to EBITDA, interest coverage, et cetera. Uh, because in a rising rate environment, uh, it can become more difficult for high yield companies to refinance. And we'll talk about that later. Um, also, Michael, um, Marty has done some work looking at the correlation between credit spreads and the VIX and has found that when you have a period where the VIX rises above 30 for an extended period of time, uh, it's more likely that credit spreads can uh, 
blowout to from an area of about 200 over to 900 uh, and over. And before we go down that route, I just want to m make another comment to everybody. Um, starting after the financial crisis, uh, CNBC and other places have been talking a lot about HYG and looking at HYG or HYGH. And these um, ETFs tell you very little about high yield spreads because they have a duration component to it. So when bonds trade off, yields go up, the HYG index goes down, and it doesn't really tell you whether double Bs are trading at 200 over or 800 over. So um, there's no way around that shortcut and HYG just doesn't do it. Um, it would be like going to the doctor and, and, and you know, the doctor checking your weight and saying you're fine. It's a lot deeper than that. And if you do want to see what the high yield spread is, you can go to the St. Louis Fed uh, and pull up the ICE index, which shows you that uh, double Bs have only widened out uh, to about 400 over at the moment, and they're not in the red zone yet. You know, we, we were talking, uh, George hosted something over the weekend. I'm not sure if it was over the weekend or last week. There is a HYG, I don't know if it's HYGH. It is interest, they, they have interest rate hedged ETFs for that exact reason. Yeah, but it, it still doesn't. If I said, um, Michael, tell me what double B spreads are by looking at at H, oh, uh, yeah. YG. It's going to tell you if they're going up or down, sure. Yeah, it'll tell you if they're going up or down, but why take that when you can get, you know, a more accurate reading? It would be like flying a plane and saying, well, we may be, you know, a 1,000 feet off the ground or we may be, you know, uh, 2,000 feet off the ground. Um, if you go to uh, look at the Merrill Lynch uh, B of A um high yield index, you'll know exactly where you are and you should, you know, you'll be able to, uh, to, to uh, discern from that. Um, and also one thing that has been helping high yield of late is the uh, great performance of the energy sector. And we know in past credit spread widening episodes that energy has uh, been a problem and has contributed to widening and deterioration in high yield, but that is absolutely not the case uh, this cycle. Any other thoughts on this? Yeah, well, you make a good point, though. There's, you know, when you talk about growth and value, which is a very binary way to think about the market, there's crap on either side of it. There's, there's low quality growth and there's low quality value. And there's something George and I have talked about a lot that you really want to stay closer to the middle than at the tails of, of the style trade uh, for the foreseeable future really avoiding expensive junk and cheap out this year. And some have continued to widen out. Some have come in a lot. You know, BAA spreads, if you look at Moody's BAA, they're back to like 190 and change, um, which is pretty much maybe a little higher than where we started the year, but they got as high as that two and a quarter or 240 uh, a couple months ago. Do you, how, how do you see kind of the reason for spreads widening out and where do you see spreads going the rest of the year? In fact, that's one of the topics that Marty's going to talk about. So um, he has developed a, a high yield valuation model. The, if we talk about the inputs to high yield valuation models, and, and we're going to talk about, uh, to your point, Michael, is, is what is... What do we anticipate in terms of high yield spreads? And are there any leading indicators that we can look at to determine if we're heading to a credit episode? We'll talk about that. But if you look at the inputs, and I've been telling uh, the room for quite some time, one of the, one of the important inputs is the five-year rate. Because uh, if you look at the maturity of high yield bonds, they're generally of shorter mature maturity than investment grade. For example, um, five, an average five-year issue is, and the high yield index is about five years in uh, maturity or duration. And investment grade uh, is, is much longer, seven to 10 years, uh, while a company like Apple or J&J &J can have a 50-year bond 
because they're triple A, that will never happen uh, with a single B company for for a lot of reasons that we can talk about. So if high if five year rates are going up, it also means just like a house, a mortgage, that refinancing uh, becomes much more difficult, especially if you have levered loans that are adjustable rate. So the one indicator or input to high yield valuation models uh, is the five-year yield. The other inputs that we'll talk about more deeply is the health of the economy, which is reflected in capacity utilization and industrial production. Um, We also look at credit availability by looking at the bank um, lending surveys on willingness to lend, which is extremely healthy right now. And we also look at whether QE is a headwind or a tailwind. And it's still a tailwind until it becomes a hailwind because we haven't seen the reduction in in bank balance sheets yet. (laughs) And then lastly, uh, an important indicator is default rates. And default rates are currently at um, record lows. So Uh, We have still very good conditions for um, high yield. um, Bob, would you call call those leading indicators or more coincident? I I would say that they can function a little bit as as both because sometimes we have spread widening due to liquidity problems. And, um, And then those liquidity episodes fade away. And high yield spreads back, you know, they can snap back into place. So if you look at these, um, if you look at a valuation model uh, by looking at these inputs, it kind of can tell you, are we seeing a false alarm? And is it a buying, uh, is it, is it a buying um, opportunity or is it not? But you're right. It's more of a coincident indicator and a validation of, of value. I guess I would just add, Again, everything I look at cyclically that I believe to be leading indicators of earnings and therefore leading indicators of credit are all pointing sharply lower. And they lead by anywhere from two years to nine months. And what are those? some of those indicators, Michael? Change in long rates, change in short rates, change in oil, change in prices paid index, the change in the NHB, housing activity, uh, change in money supply growth. And all of those things globally, if you take them in Europe, they're all doing the same thing. They take them around, you know, from global composites, they're all doing the same thing. They basically, the, the, ch- the changes in the cost of money and the cost of goods. And when those go up, the economy slows. So this to me is the broadest tightening we've ever seen, ever. And, and we're, we're only at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. So if anybody wants to come up, uh, please raise your hand. I'm, I'm a little bit clumsy um, because I haven't co-hosted before in the past. Um, But um, yeah, so to recap what we're talking about so far, it's a time to look at quality. And um, it appears um, that uh, one of the reasons that the Russell 2000 has been underperforming is because it is a lower quality index with a lot more below investment grade names that are leading the pack in there. That, that's, a, that's a super important point because you know, we hear a lot from institutional investors, and I know, you know there's a pretty sharp move in the dollar, which George was just talking about, that's likely to continue, whether because it's the Fed's behind the curve or the world is slowing or both. And oftentimes people think stronger dollar, well, I want to buy domestic companies, I want to buy small caps, which for the reasons you just said, they're riskier, the quality, the fundamentals are worse, they're more cyclical, et cetera, is, is – Not at all what you want to be doing today. Right. Right. Okay. On what we've talked about so far, can we, um, uh, we welcome any uh, questions until Marty gets in here. I'd love to just say you'd explain maybe to the, to the, uh, the group listeners, when you talk, when you, when you say the word quality, that's one of those phrases that can mean different things to different people. Sometimes people say a, high, a company with a high dividend yields a high-quality company, which I don't agree with whatsoever, uh, or a cheap company is a high-quality company, or a profitable company, or a, you know, a strong balance sheet. So how do you think about quality? How would you define that 
from one or many metrics? I, I would say the, the lazy and most convenient way to do it. And we know that there's a lot of problems with rating agencies and uh, the rating agencies contributed to the great financial crisis because uh, the ratings are definitely a lagging indicator. Um, however, if something is rate, rated a single B or triple C or double B, uh, you should really, really think twice. And I wish we could. To, I don't have access to a Bloomberg these days, Michael. But you know, uh, I used to do sorts uh, and scans based on credit ratings as a starting point, and then dig deeper into um, cash flow, um, interest coverage. Um, and um, leverage of a company. So a highly levered company uh, with um, high uh, interest uh, payment and the ability to pay interest uh, and having a single B or double B rating is definitely a low quality company, right? You can't escape it. Um, Netflix, um, you're going to hear a lot of talk about... um, their their debt and their um, ability and uh, to uh, meet obligations if subscriber growth goes down. But when a low quality company has an earning surprise like we saw today, I can assure you that the uh, price volatility is much much higher uh, than it is uh, than a, than a high quality company. And I would also think and. Here's a question for you, Michael, is that um, is higher vol on a company stock a um, sometimes a signal of quality? It can be, but not always. Like if, if we um, we've done work on this, like if you if you scatter the beta of every company in the S&P 500 or whatever index you choose, and if you scatter that on the X axis with, let's say, uh, Moody's credit ratings or S&P's credit ratings or quality ratings, it is not a linear a relationship. There's it, it, really no relationship. So it can be where a, a company could be really volatile because it's got low quality and it's just going up and down, up and down, up and down. Or it could just be a very cyclical company. I remember back in 2009, 10, 11, everyone was calling Caterpillar a piece of junk and asking, well, why was the stock going up? Because it's a cyclical stock, and the global economy was cyclically rebounding. So that, that's an example of, let's say, a higher beta stock that is more is more volatile just because of its business lines rather than its fundamental attributes. I call Caterpillar a high-quality company, but it's just very cyclical. Right, right. So, um, by the way, with regard to the curve inversion, I'm hoping at some point in the future uh, we can get Cam Harvey uh, on here, who is the Duke professor, um, who uh, has done the original work on uh, the shape of the yield curve and economic cycles that go back. But we, we you know, the curve inversion, when the curve inverts for uh, a matter of days or weeks, uh, it's really not a, a good alarm. And it's even become a more difficult alarm because of quantitative easing, which has kind of muted the steepness of the curve for obvious reasons. Uh, the Fed bought the long end and bought long, longer mortgages. But um, so we, we, some of the smoke alarms have been uh, disconnected, if you will, that is going to make it uh, difficult to um, forecast um, any kind of significant economic um, downdraft here. But um, the other thing we probably should talk about at some point is, you know, if we have nominal economic growth of 3% and uh, an inflation at 8%, that, you know, uh, does that meet the technical definition of a recession? I could speak to the yield curve real quick. The point you right. made totally agree. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, the information power of the yield curve as a forecasting tool for macro and markets is really about the short end. It's really about how much the Fed is cutting rates or how much the Fed is easing. You know, that's the big 
multiplier of policy because you know when ten year rates move up and down, that you know that can play into mortgage rates and so that'll affect housing. But when the Fed raises rates or cuts rates, they're shifting the prime rate, which is going to change auto loans, installment loans for consumers, uh, HELOC loans, credit card rates, all of that. And that's why, at the end of the day, you know, the Fed's raising rates, you're getting a flatter yield curve. But really, the economy slows, not because the yield curve uh, inverts or declines. It slows because the Fed raises rates, and that always creates a slowdown 100 percent of the time and whether you go into recession is a function you know whether you're, you get oil joining the fed which today we do i don't know if you heard bullard today on cnbc bullard was talking about um they were showing a clip uh right around two 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 o'clock p.m today and bullard was on tv today talking about you know his comment about a 75 basis point rate hike and he said well we did that in 94 and things were fine and in 94, we had no inflation. We, we didn't have oil prices going up. Uh, you had consumer credit going up 25% annually, which we're nowhere near that today. Uh, and we are at the beginning of the housing bubble uh, that lasted 10, 11 years. And so I just thought that, I don't know if you saw that, George, but I thought that comment was hilarious that he was trying to compare today to 1994 and saying it's safe to raise rates. Oh, oh please. Oh, please. Oh, please. <laughs> All right, Michael K., I can't thank you. We're going to get you in here one of these days, you being the key speaker. So I guess this is the warm-up for, yeah. for your big appearance. All right, but take care. Th thank you so much, Michael. All right, Bobby J., the floor is yours with Marty now. So here we go. Okay, Marty, while, while you were um, coming on to the app, I did give you an uh, illustrious introduction. Uh, I did hear that. Your, I heard that. Thank you very much. Your, nice. your books. Uh, I know at this stage of your life, you're tired of these great introductions. You've had so many of them. Um, so why don't we just kick it off? We got into it a little bit. And why don't you just give, uh, at first, your take on the current high-yield market and uh, below investment grade spreads and um, the, the uh, valuations. Uh, many of us are looking for um, credit to show some signposts of, um, of a recession uh, if and when it comes, and and also any distress in the market. Uh, but give us your take on valuations at this point, and also uh, the underwriting of the past uh, two or three years that was with relation to um, QE. I'll start there. All right. Well, uh, the you know, key, key statistic in valuation is the risk premium uh, or the Yield spread over treasuries. Uh, and, uh, I use the ICE B of A U.S. High Yield Index, which is the uh, the Merrill Lynch index that we used to use uh, when we were working there. And uh, that's currently uh, they have an option adjusted spread <clears throat> that's uh, currently at 364 basis points. Now, to put that in context, the uh, historical median spread is 492 basis points the mean or your know, average is 545 basis points and that's about where it would be uh, i believe if you didn't have the extraordinary fed support underneath the market um, if uh, the model uh, that i uh, use of the spread uh, would put it about a uh, hundred, you know, uh, you know, you know hundred eighty wider than it is now. Um, now it wouldn't be by any means the uh, widest it's been. And in, in uh, December of two thousand eight, the spread got to uh, two thousand one hundred forty seven basis points. Now that was during the, uh, by uh, most measures, the the worst recession since the Great Depression of the nineteen thirties. But if there is any um, expectation of recession, it's very hard to find it in that spread of 364 basis points. So, Marty, would you say that QE has, um, I use the term disconnected smoke alarms, has it, um, has it, um, we know it, it, it can affect equity prices and home prices, but has it done something to high yield spreads that you think is healthy, uh, unhealthy? Is it 
um, kind of clouded the picture? I think it's fair to say it's clouded the picture. I, I loved your metaphor about disconnecting the smoke alarm because uh, you're not you're, you're certainly not seeing it. You're not seeing a big pickup in distressed credits. Uh, one of my other contributions was uh, creating the definition of distressed as issues that are at a thousand basis points or more. And that's been running about 2% of the total on average over time. That's up in you know 10% or more. Uh, so it's, uh, yeah, I, I think the trail inevitably leads back to the Fed. And, uh, you know, they had the reasons that you, they, they, get, they get criticism from both sides. I think it's about the toughest job in the world to uh, set monetary policy. But I don't think there's any way getting out of it that spreads would be wider. Um, the if the the Fed had not been in there buying, now they did stop buying on March 9th. Uh, we've yet to see any real uh, reaction to that. You know, the market's not going to change overnight. They still have the multi-trillion-dollar portfolio, of course, and they haven't yet started to liquidate. You know, there's the so-called quantitative tightening. Um, so I guess we're still in the era of the effect of the quantitative easing. <clears throat> but um, the, you know, I think any time you intervene as aggressively as that, there are going to be uh, consequences, some of which are not going to be favorable for the long term. Uh, they uh, evidently felt that those measures were necessary when the recession you know, the mini recession, the shortest recession on record by the National Bureau of Economic Research's uh, uh, judgment uh, in 2020. And, um, you know, say they made that judgment that was necessary, but I think went into it knowing that it was going to have other consequences and to the extent it's distorted uh, the cost of capital, possibly encouraged some uh, more dubious kind of deals to get done during that period and possibly at uh, uh, lower yields than w uh, was appropriate. That's that's going to uh, have some consequences, if not immediately down the road, uh, they will. And Marty, this this question may be out, out of your um, bailiwick, but if it wasn't for QE, can um, do you have a, any uh, view or point to any research to say what the curve would really look like? Well, you know, it's it's pretty flat right now, and the and the economy is doing well. Now, maybe that's artificially induced in turn by that uh, Fed, uh, you know, Fed easing. But <clears throat> um, so it's hard to separate the two. You know, if if the uh, you know, the Fed policy had a positive impact on the real economy. You have uh, consumers in relatively good shape because they haven't gone out and bought a lot of big ticket items over uh, the, the last few years. They haven't done some of the travel and uh, other expenses. So they're in comparatively good shape. The um, uh, ec economic indicators, just the, uh, this uh, in the past few days, we had the industrial production and capacity utilization, which are two that happen to be very important for high yield spreads. Uh, those were up and beat uh, economists' expectations for them. So there are still good things you can point to. And in, so it, it suggests that um, you, we wouldn't be flatter than uh, a 40, uh, 40 basis point uh, with, uh, between the two and 10 year, which um, you know, compares uh, historically uh, to, uh, you know, I think, think uh, you know, about 120 or so. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's not clear to me. You, we, we might be inverted from two to 10 at this point, if not for all this. But uh, again, it's, it's not we're not at an ordinary an ordinary uh, that is reasonably steep yield curve. You know, Marty, uh, three things that I think um, I always have on my desk or um, on my dashboard. Well, first of all, everybody should have uh, financial statement analysis on their desk. Sure. Uh, but also um, in terms of the Fritzen high yield valuation model mm -hmm. uh, and also your VIX 
um, high yield spread model. Uh, but with your high yield valuation model, what is it giving you any indication now as to whether um, spreads uh, are cheap or rich? Yeah, um, <clears throat> the uh, you know this as I say the spread would be uh, about uh, about to the historical average of five forty five. Uh, you know, I mean that's the the fair value is in that. Uh, uh, well, I, I no, I, I, it, it, it's no, it's not. No, I'm sorry, not not as quite as that, but it would be um, uh, it's already in the neighborhood of the uh, historical median of four hundred ninety two. So at 364, that is uh, quite a significant uh, gap. You know, right? It it, it puts it in uh, the range of, uh, of um, you know an extreme, uh, which is about 125 basis points, or you know one standard error in the model. Um, but because of the uh, that we include in the model a, a so-called a dummy variable saying you know, there is quantitative easing currently or there isn't, you know, there was as of the, uh, um, as of March 9th, but we haven't yet taken that uh, off because I think there's a clear lingering effect of that. Um, so we're uh, with that in place, the, 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 uh, the uh, current uh, spread is not at an extreme, but, um, again, you know, the, the question is, well, uh, you know, now that the Fed has taken that off and it, particularly if they were moved um, to move to start liquidating that huge bond portfolio that they've created, it, we're going to uh, be in a very different, uh, different state. And and also, can you um, so if we uh, many people like to use the VIX yep. as, as kind of um, a a warning signal of sorts. And we've seen spikes in the VIX go up to 35 or 40 and then just drop back down. So I don't want to say that those are false alarms, but um, talk about the VIX and its relationship to high yield spreads. And when does a certain VIX movement become serious in your mind? Because you have that connected to credit. Yeah, um, I uh, VIX has about a 71% correlation with the high yield spread, which is a, a strong correlation. I mean, it you know, says that that factor alone explains about 50% of the variance you know, in, in the uh, high yield spread over time. So I might say, well, why don't you include that in your model uh, if it's such a powerful uh, explainer? And the reason for that is that I kind of view it as the sort of emotional element in the market and the model is really aimed at more fundamentally driven uh, investors uh, who are looking at things like credit availability, some of the economic indicators, the level of treasury yields, which has an inverse correlation, meaning that the lower the treasury yield, all else being equal, the wider the high yield spread and vice versa. <clears throat> so the VIX is not part of the model, but it um, uh, it, it has a, a very uh, strong connection. And recently uh, we had one of those episodes that you described. It didn't last very long, but the spread, uh, the VIX, which uh, its long run average is right around 20. And that's about where it is. Uh, just before I got on the program, it was at 21 and change. But on um, March uh uh, uh, if, the, if the uh, uh, March 8th was a day that got to uh, it, it bloomed all the way out to 36. Now, if the high yield spread were a function of just that one factor, you would have expected the high yield spread on that date to be right at around 900 basis points the actual spread was 400 basis points. So that is just a, you know, a gigantic disparity. Now, of course, the spread is not only driven by that one factor, but I think what it shows you is the uh, credit market is uh, particularly uh, highlighted by the, uh, the high yield uh, spread is taking 
things are going on in the economy, uh, the whole uh, complex of the Ukraine war, the resulting inflation, the resulting uh, stepped up effort by the Fed to rein in inflation and the resulting rise in interest rates, which could, uh, if, if the Fed fails to achieve the uh, soft landing, bring about a recession. Um, when all that came to a head and you saw the VIX blow out, you know, an ex- expectation that we'd see a lot more volatility in stock prices over the next thir- uh, 30 days, uh, you know, in that so-called fear gauge of the market, you really had a non-reaction uh, in the credit market. Right, right. Um, so that's somewhat comforting. So, 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 Bobby, let me just ask you something because I'm yeah. like, like ninety nine percent of the people in this room. I'm, I'm just a dumb equity guy. So, can we just go back, uh, Marty? What I want to know is, you know, heretofore, credit's been like a non-issue this cycle. I think before you got in the room, maybe you heard me talking at the outset. Yeah. It, and, and to go to Bobby J's point. You know, they, they kind of disconnect all the fire alarms or another great metaphor. I like they sprayed the runways down with so much foam, like nothing could possibly happen. <laughs> are, are we finally getting to the point where that's in the process of changing? I mean, it, it, so, it, it, that's number one. Number two, what should dumb equity guys like us be looking at? I mean, we know HYG, Bobby's explained, that doesn't work. Um, and HYGH doesn't work because I know. There was a discussion about you know, the duration element to HYG. So someone said, look at HYGH. says, no, no, that's no good. And then JNK is no good. JNKH is no good. So unless we know you, we can keep calling you every day. So what's going on credit? What's going on credit? What should the average stock guy, equity guy, be looking at to get an idea of what's going on in the credit market? Yeah, you know, that's uh, that's pretty tough right now. Uh, they say that uh, really all the traditional signals have been turned off and uh, that may not change for a while, um, you know, because of that, the Fed, that just unprecedented kind of Fed policy. I mean, I call it what they've done since 2020, uh, quantitative easing on steroids, because ordinary quantitative easing was something we hadn't seen since the Korean War. And then they really stepped up to go out buying even corporate bonds. They didn't wind up doing a lot of that, but they opened the door to even buying corporate bonds. Um, so, it's it's pretty tough to find something now i think if you do see some big you know if you start to see big uh widening in the spreads i think that'll be a signal that something has indeed changed one thing i think uh bob mentioned um uh, rich bernstein uh, earlier and when i was uh and, and rich and bob and i were all working at merrill lynch i uh after i came up with the definition of distressed bonds as those trading at a thousand basis points or more over treasuries, I then said, well, we can let's use an indicator of the distress ratio, which has been adopted by some others in the market. S&P uses it. Um, I don't know, if, but Rich was the one who really got me to see that there was a lot more. He started using it as an equity indicator. And so it notes the percentage of issues in the high yield index that are trading at a thousand or more over treasuries. And um, again, that's uh, averages about you know, 10% or so, but in recessions, it gets out to typically 30% or more. At one point, believe it or not, in the uh, uh, depths of the Great Recession, it got to 87%. Yeah. Of so, all the so- issues. Yeah. yeah. So, so I, I guess try to put like when I'm, the reason I asked the question I, the way I did is because a lot of the guys in these rooms are they're, they're not most people in this room are not credit guys. They're just equity yeah. guys, and Thanks we know sir. credit. We know credit's important. So let me ask the question a slightly different way, yeah. or slightly, or a different question entirely. Okay. So I've been of the belief that interest rates can go up a lot more than people imagine, and they're going up even faster than I thought was going to happen. And the reason I say that, listening to you talk, it just makes me think that even more. And that's because, so, you know, we hand out all these checks, these stimulus checks to everybody, the the huge fiscal expansion, the public sector surplus, sorry, the public sector deficit is a private sector surplus. So corporations' balance sheets are in reasonably good shape. Individuals' balance sheets are in reasonably good shape. Of course, it's unfortunate, but as always, the bottom 40% of the socioeconomic strata are are getting crushed. But leave that aside for a second. So if you say to yourself, okay, how much will interest rates impact 
credit. Not all not all rate hikes are, are created equal, i.e., you know, you're talking about draining liquidity. In other words, if everyone's super levered and you raise interest rates two or three hundred basis points, you get one set of outcomes. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, if people's balance sheets are relatively in better shape, you're gonna get a less of an impact. And so my question to you, I guess, would be given how, how the relatively good shape of consumers and corporations, isn't the economy in a better shape to withstand rate hikes? than would have been the case, say, 10 years ago? Yeah, I, th- I think that's right. And, uh, you know, th- they, we also put through some bank reforms at that time. So that I would add what that one additional sector uh, that's in uh, better shape than it was then uh, doesn't have the kind of leverage, which uh, there was a lot of debate about uh, what had happened in deregulation. But I think, uh, uh, you know, companies, uh, banks, capital, positions are, are better than they were going into that. So uh, I, I think that's right. It will put a, a damper on home buying, but, you know, uh, but that's, so, you know, that sector might be more. Right. Sensitive. But, but yeah, but, but the account, economy is more than just housing. So exactly. Let me, so let me go to the next step then. Okay. So all the talking heads, Oh, you know, they can't raise rates. They're going to do this. They're going to do QE, QT. Oh, the economy is going to break. Oh, we only could do one rate hike, two rate hikes, three rate hikes. Well, if the economic actors in the system, be a consumers, corporations, banks, are in relatively good shape, and the idea of the um, the, the Fed tightening is they want to, the only way that, I mean, okay, he's back up for a second, right? They, 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 they're, they're walking the wall, they're talking the talk about wanting to re- bring down inflation. Talk is cheap. So far, they're engaging in open mouth operations. Will they walk the walk? <laughs> Don't know. But the idea is they want to tighten financial conditions because that's a means of slowing the economy. And so the idea is, you know, the common sense wisdom is, oh, well, you know, they'll, they'll raise rates and they'll tighten until something breaks. And then people say, whoa, look at 2018. You know, they only raised rates so many times and they were only doing QT, $50 billion a month. And then by December of 2018, they had the blink and it was all off. So now, ha, ha, ha. The idea that the market says they're going to raise rates nine times and yada, 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 and do $95 billion a month can't possibly happen. To me, that is stockbroker economics at its worst. Okay, That is the worst of CNBC and Steve Wiesman and that whole crowd, and I'm mentioning names, and he can come on this show. Okay, These guys are just parroting garbage. If what you say is true, if what you say is true, rates, and if the idea is they're going to raise rates until they slow the economy, to really tighten financial conditions, until something breaks. That leads me to think they can tighten a hell of a lot more than the morons on CNBC would say. What would you say to that? Yeah, well, I'll be a little less bold <laughs> to how I refer to anyone else uh, uh, commenting, but... Uh, so, um, so, 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 Marty, please respond. Ignore the colorful uh, pros. Yeah, yeah, no, no. Yeah, I, yeah, I p- please just respond to the substance of what I'm saying. <clears throat> yeah, sure. No, I, I understand. Uh but uh, I, th- I saw a very good comment recently that I think strengthens your point even further, saying that when the Fed has succeeded in uh, uh, achieving a soft landing, it's because they uh, did the right things on, mon- uh, 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 on money supply it, at the same time as they were raising rates. And th- this uh, commentator was arguing that the hard landings resulted because they um, didn't take the proper steps with the monetary aggregates at the same time as they were raising rates. So I think it, again, amplifies your point that it, it shows a path to raise rates as aggressively as you're describing uh, and yet not uh, trigger a recession as is uh, the fear or alternatively to say, well, they can't possibly do that because it would inevitably trigger a recession the reason i'm going down all these rabbit hole is because for all the oh nothing to worry about blah 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 i mean bullshit you look at what's already you know tina look at what's already happened to the so-called equity risk premium which is horse shit but look at what's happened to the equity risk premium as rates have shot up you know like out of a cannon all right and then if you tack on another 100 basis points or just throw a number out there Onto the on, on, on to fixed income yields, you know, try on a four percent ten year for stars. Just just to start the conversation, and then tell me what the relative valuation of equities looks like at a time the economy is slowing and earnings estimates are going down. Like to me, 
I'm sorry to get so hot about this, but this is talking about variant perception. To me, this is the essence of it. This is why I think the stock market is on death row. So, you know, you, you, t- you know, so, so actually in a way it's, 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 you know, people say, well, you know, the economy is in a strong shape. Consumer balance sheets are in good shape. Blah, 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 blah. That's exactly why interest rates are going to go up a lot more. So let me put it another way more. Let me ask you a question. Forget about credit for a second. Do you think, I mean, I know credit has two parts. I mean, there's a credit piece and the fixed income piece, whatever, the, 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 the government bond piece. Mm-hmm. What is your view of, 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 say, government bond? Let's just start with government, with treasuries. What is your outlook on treasuries? Don't be browbeat by all the bullshit I just threw at you. But just more generally speaking, leave credit out of it for a second. What's your view on rates? Well, um, the uh, you know, it, it, it will depend a lot on inflation, the um, treasury, uh, you know, the tips break even rate, uh, which basically the uh, difference in yield between conventional treasuries and the treasury inflation protected securities, uh, which adjust the print, you know, the, the final principal amount to the inflation over the life of that. Uh, those, uh, those, uh, that indicator, as well as uh, economic forecasters uh, consensus view does not certainly uh, suggest that we're going to remain at an eight and a half percent inflation rate for an extended period. Um, and that really in, in five years, we'll be back down to uh, more, uh, more normal uh, or, you know, rates, not that not dramatically higher from where we are now, um, you know, in the interim, uh, if inflation uh you know, persists uh, longer than uh, you know the, the optimi- the most optimistic uh, uh, folks out there think. Um, you know, we could see some further upward pressure, but we're not. Um, uh, you know, I'm a, a, a partner in a business called uh, Lehman, Libby, and Fritz and Advisors, as Bob mentioned, and um, we're not uh, you know counting on or you know uh, it, it's not our scenario that we're going to see interest rates going up, you know, in, in any time soon to the four or, you know, four or five percent range. Um, so we may be a little bit uh, more uh, bullish as far as rates than you're suggesting. But um, uh, the, um, you know, that's that's not our, our view at this point. Yeah, but we, we continue to monitor things. We you have to be ready to um, well, uh, change well, course. Yeah, Marty, let, me, let, me, Marty, let me ask this question. OK, so. I can accept that inflation will come down at some point, um, but the the point is less about is it going to come down or not, but whether it stays up at a high level for a sustained period of time. In other yep. words, yep. I don't have to say to you, oh, you know, my bear case is 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 based on inflation going to fourteen percent. Although I actually think it's a possibility, we can talk about that as well. But if I just said to you, hey, you know what, inflation is going to it's up at eight or wherever it is. And it's going to stay up here for a while. And God forbid the Canadian oil mafia is right and oil prices keep going up. You know, all bets are off. But food prices are accelerating to the upside. Rents are still accelerating. Energy has been accelerating. Um, Deglobalization and shortening supply chain is inflationary. So let's just say inflation stays at, you know, seven. I'm going to be nice to you. (laughs) Inflation is at six or seven. Forget about 13. All right. Okay. How in God's name do you get inflation down to what's deemed to be an acceptable level without a proper tightening? Because we're still running a wildly, wildly expansive uh, uh, monetary policy. Real rates are unbelievably low. So how do you get, I mean, I go back, I read Arthur Burns and past cycles and the whole deal. I mean, the only way Volcker did it was by having a proper tightening. You've got to get real rates up and they're still way too negative. So how do you get inflation down in a meaningful way Without a proper tightening, that's the question. Well, the one other <clears throat> factor that we haven't really uh, mentioned yet is inflationary expectations. Um, you know, where when you re- where you really have a problem is if uh, the expectation is that inflation is going to remain at the high level over an extended period. Um, you know, w- w- you know another difference between, or you know, th- 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 a difference between. The present situation and the uh, high inflation level that uh, Volcker came in and tamed was that we had a substantially larger uh, portion of the workforce that was uni- uh, unionized at that point, and 
a larger portion of the collect, uh, collective bargaining agreements that were in place then than are now had cost of living adjustments. So you, uh, a lot of that has really fallen by the wayside. And uh, so, uh, you know, I, and uh, so it's hard. Uh, it's hard to talk about how you would do it completely separately from will it be necessary to do it? In other words, um, if, you know, if you took, uh, you know, uh, in November, already back in November, the Fed dropped the term transitory from their messaging about inflation. So they've accepted that, yeah, it's not just a matter of a couple of months and then the supply chain disruptions uh, disappear and inflation comes back to our target 2% rate. You know, they've thrown in a towel on that. But then there's question. Well, there's still a lot of distance between that and saying, okay, we're stuck with, as you say, even you know, six percent inflation over the next uh, decade, or uh, or anything like that. You know, necessitating the type of, of very strong medicine that Volcker administered. Um, if we get to that stage, if you get to the point, what I think, I mean, I remember go, you know going into diners that uh, didn't even want to have printed menus because they were changing the prices so often, you know, they just wanted to leave the, the price uh, part uh, blank and, you know, fill it in for that day. Um, uh, you know, if we get back into that kind of, uh, uh, you know, scenario, then yeah, you're going to have to have a uh, Volcker 2.0 and, um, you know, a very, very, uh, very severe tightening of, uh, you know, short-term rates, uh, and in addition to the you know quantitative tightening, uh, and you know undoing a lot of what's been done in the last several years, um, but I, you know the, the, I I wouldn't say that we're you know that we're inevitably on that road at this point. Marty, you're fantastic. I'll give you a rest for a second. So I have some incredibly inc- for me incredibly exciting news. I'm just getting a shiver up my spine looking at this. I don't know how this just happened, but. Um, so let me back up. So we're incredibly fortunate to have people like Bobby J and Marty Fritz and spending their time to educate us. And we've had an unbelievable run of fabulous speakers in this room. You know, Albert Supporta, Stan Weinstein, Michael Belkin, Michael Green, Tony Greer, Tom Thornton, just go down the list, endless. And they're going to keep, the hits are keep on coming, just so you know. Um, we've got Peter Atwater, Professor Peter Atwater from William Mary. He does fabulous behavioral economics work. He's coming back to talk to us, uh, I think it's on May 4th or something like that. We have the Volatility King, Chem, coming in next week to talk. We have Mr. Verone, Master Tiction from Stahegas, coming to talk. I mean, these are world-class people. So you know I'm, 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 I'm softening up for the ask here. Well, guess what, boys and girls? I just looked at this now, and I don't know what the heck just happened, but you're aware we try to give to charity. We've uh, identified uh, World Central Kitchen as our um as, as our as our charity and as of yesterday we were at thirty seven thousand dollars well i just looked now it's in my twitter feed we're up at forty eight thousand we just took in like ten eleven thousand in the course of the last few hours and what's even more exciting is there's a fellow in the audience his name is grant he's going to go by the name grant he doesn't want he doesn't want to that's, that's his name he wants to stay anonymous he had, he is pledging um, a matching offer, two thousand dollars. In other words, he's willing to put up two thousand dollars if the room will match that two thousand dollars. We did this the other day; it was highly successful. So just know if you give for every dollar you give right now, someone else is going to match it with another dollar. That's up to two thousand dollars. So we have a chance to break the fifty thousand dollar mark uh, here in the next few minutes. And if you think this room has been a value, if these things think these rooms have been a value then please give, please give generously. I do this for no personal gain. Um, the people in Ukraine are really hurting. World Central Kitchen does God's work. Other organizations can't even go in there or won't go in there because they're getting bombed on. I believe there was, there was a, a, blurb, a blurb the other day, and if Carol's feeling better, she can come up and talk, but I think they got bombed on. I mean, these people are literally taking their life in their own hands. So we have in this room what I keep referring to as a first world problem. Um, everyone here is trying to either protect or increase their net worth. There are people out there in a hell of a lot worse situation than we are. So I'm, I'm tickled pink that we were up to 48,000 
And my heartfelt thanks to Grant for offering to pledge $2,000 in a match. So um, I'll try to put, uh, I'll try to put it up in the nest, but it's up at the top of my Twitter feed, uh, World Central Kitchen. If you go to my Twitter feed, you'll find it. There's a link there. And um, again, I can't thank you enough. Please give forward. It's, it's, there, there are people out there who are hurting and really in need. All right. With that, um, Bobby, I can keep peppering Marty, but I think you had some questions now. I will, yeah. I will let you get a word on Bobby. The floor is yours. I, I, I have two uh, questions, Marty. If we are running uh, 6% GDP with um, nominal growth at uh, 3%, that does not qualify as an inflation, correct? I mean, as a recession. Well, yeah, <laughs> I'd say say not. Right. But what does that mean for for high yield credits? Is well, that a plus? <clears throat> you know, um, they, uh, you know, it, to the, the extent there, it, it really comes down to the ability to pass along cost increases and um, you know the, the, that's going to sort out by industry and by company. Um, you know, so a little hard to generalize. There's a, a representation nowadays, um, not unlike what you see in the stock market, and not as you know as representative in every single sector. But uh, as opposed to at, at times in the past, there was a very strong domination by. Uh, E and P companies at one point, uh, the uh, you know media, telecommunications at another point was uh, very dominant. But you know energy is um, still the uh, largest sector, but um, uh, you know about thirteen percent of the total, and that includes uh, pipelines, refiners, uh, and 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 all the rest, uh, service oil service companies, and so forth. So you have um, consumer goods companies, uh, basic industry companies, financial uh, companies in there. So I, I think you can, just as you look in the stock market and say, well, they're expected to be some winners and losers from inflation, you're going to see the same uh, here. Now, to the extent you have unexpected um, inflation, uh, in other words, that was not uh, foreseen by the long-term bond yields that uh, companies were able to borrow at and they have uh, taken advantage of the rate environment in the last couple of years to push their debt maturities out. So they have a lot of that borrowing costs locked in for an extended period of time. Well, if that didn't have as high a an inflation premium built in, which I think is pretty clearly the case as uh, we're seeing if, if we do see a, a persistent uh, inflation rate uh, at the level we've seen now, then almost by definition, they, ben- they, they, re- they benefit from the inflation in the sense that they are, uh, you know, have a, a lower cost of capital than uh, would have been ju- justified by the uh, inflation had people foreseen it. They're raising their prices, have their borrowing costs locked in for an extended period. So they're coming out ahead on that trade. Okay. And Marty, um, one more question, and I'll open it up to the audience. But um, what I've been concerned about lately is the debate of growth versus value of long duration stocks, which I know Rich Bernstein always did some work on. But what I see more importantly, particularly, and, and there's a lot of discussion over the ARC portfolio. Yep. When I look at the ARC portfolio, I see that the top holdings for, by and large, are below investment grade, double B or lower. Today, we had the Netflix results, double B company. So I think when a double B company misses earnings, uh, it's a lot different than a double a company missing earnings for some reason of late um is it fair to say that we should be more concerned with quality than growth versus value yeah the cycle uh yes and uh i recall um at, at a point uh, similar in the cycle perhaps a little further along when 
I think there was a, a clearer consensus that the economy was heading into recession. Andy Melnick, who headed equity research at Merrill Lynch um, at that time, uh, put out a directive saying that uh, at the equity analysts could not put out buy recommendations on companies that did not have an investment grade that is triple B or higher uh, credit rating. <clears throat> and whether uh, yeah, B of A uh, as a successor company will do something like that at some point or other firms will, I think you'll still have some uh, thought uh, along those lines. Now, that being said, uh, below investment grade ratings have become more uh, acceptable at one time. Yeah, the companies really were thought to be, uh, you know, junk companies. Uh, you know, as the high yield market got better established, there's been less of a stigma associated with it. But I think there still will be some effect of the market becoming more conscious of companies' balance sheets, and as you know, uh, as sort of a symbol of their uh, their credit uh, willing uh, worthiness and some concern that uh, uh, credit uh, will get uh, tighter as you see the economy turn down and therefore uh, those stocks will be uh, seen as vulnerable and uh, will not perform as well. So I think you're quite right that that quality issue will come to the fore increasingly uh, if we see that uh, trend where we've recently seen uh, an increase from around 10 percent to 30 percent in the uh, probability of recession within 12 months. Uh, as, if that remains at that level or continues to rise, I think you, you're you quite right that we will see more of an emphasis on company quality rather than just that uh, you know, dichotomy of growth versus value. Yeah, and uh, Marty, I just want to say to the audience, by and large, that um, you would not have access to somebody uh, like Marty and and his work uh, without going to a top, uh, and I'm not sure you would get it there, uh, graduate business school in the country. Okay. The kind of work that Marty does is the stuff of graduate programs. And um, I was always very leery of approaching Marty when I was at Merrill because um, I was a, I went from research to trading, but you don't go to Marty uh, unprepared because uh, <laughs> uh, th this is not, you know, uh, right. that said, we do have an opportunity here. And I would like to open up if anybody has any questions to um, to ask the um, the uh, guru of high yield credit. Right. And Bobby, that's, again, it's, it's so right. And, and I just want to. Um, Remind everybody, I, I put it up in the nest. I don't think the link's working, but if you go to the top of my Twitter feed, I'm going to figure out this nest thing sooner or later. If you go to the top of my Twitter feed, the link for um, the World Center Kitchen is there. So please, please, please. Uh, again, there's a $2,000 match that's being offered right now. So fantastic remarks, Marty. Really, really appreciate it. Let's go to Great Quarter. Great Quarter, good to see you. What's up? Uh, George, thank you so much for having these spaces. Bob, thank you so much for co hosting. And Marty, great to uh, hear your voice again. Yeah. Uh, I, I had a question um, um, about energy high yield and, and loans, um, and um, in particular, the uh, E&P subsector. We're hearing that E&P management is being disciplined and not going out and, and, and borrowing lots of money, spending lots of money to build out their businesses, but instead they're, used, they're, they're being much more disciplined in the past. So, so, so two part question. Number one is, um, are you seeing that in, in the real world? And number two, if you think not from the issuer standpoint, but from the, the, the buyer stand, the buy side standpoint, is the buy side being constrained by ESG? Um, all right, two good questions. Uh, the, yeah, they, they definitely, that's a real effect. Uh, they, uh, you know, companies have held back their the shareholders have wanted them to return more capital and uh, the political pressure has been to uh, stop uh, cut back at least on producing fossil fuels uh, whether you know whether or not we're ready really ready to replace that with uh, renewables and 
so now, of course, the companies are getting flack on the, the other side saying, well, here gasoline prices are going up and, uh, you know, it's profiteering by the energy companies, which I, I think is just ridiculous. And it's not as if there's just a switch you can turn on and immediately start producing more. Uh, now, of course, the Z and P companies are largely independents. They're not uh, fully integrated companies. So the the, uh, the political flag is going to hit a little more at those that are uh, in the refining and marketing end of the business. But <clears throat> they have to get their oil uh, from the uh, either th- their own uh, e- exploration production or uh, the independents. So um, I, what you're talking about is a very real phenomenon as far as um the managers um the uh the 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 esg standards uh i mean whatever you think about them i think there's there's certainly if you uh you know there's uh, i I think you know we we shouldn't go get into a whole debate about global warming and everything like that but uh regardless of how you feel about it um there are not um consistent standards and you have companies that are rated highly by one ESG rater and uh, at, uh, near the bottom by another ESG rater. So uh, the uh, managers are in a, you know, impossible position to say, well, we're, we're doing a good job in ESG by some third party rater. Uh, so what they've done by and large, and I think it's very standard without saying we, we're just an ESG shop. We're offering a fund that's driven entirely by ESG. Instead, they're saying, well, uh, we do see real risks to companies, certainly if they have bad governance, you know, the G in uh, governance, we have to be concerned about uh, sustainability. And if they're a bad actor, as far as the environment, uh, the E part of it goes, uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, that's going to uh, come back and hurt the company one way or another. So what they say by and large is we've incorporated these considerations into our general credit analysis, and we're going to do our best to avoid the companies that are uh, at high risk because of some of those issues that are being highlighted. So I think they've adapted to it. I think, uh, you you know if you're managing individuals uh, accounts uh, as you know, as we do at uh, LLFA um, uh, or institutions that have taken a stance on ESG, then you will have to accommodate uh, in a special way. But it'll be it'll be a challenge to uh, perform against a non ESG specific benchmark because. Uh, energy is a big part of the uh, high yield market and of the corporate market in general. And if you see uh, energy prices or, you know, the crude oil price at a given time go from 70 to 90, um, you know, you're going to be disadvantaged pretty severely on uh, relative to your benchmark if you don't have a full or uh, more than full weighting in energy. Thank you, Marty. Sure. All right, that was a great question. Let's go to Humble now. Humble, good to see you. What's up? Hey, George. Thanks for taking my question. Um, I joined late, so I apologize if this is already talked about, but I was curious about the speaker's um, uh, opinion around how the Federal Reserve can raise rates without blowing up the U.S. government interest expense. Um given the total amount of debt levels and deficit right now, I'm struggling to do the math there. So just wanted to get yeah, no, that, 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 that's a great question. So roughly speaking, 30 trillion of debt, all things being equal, 1% on the interest expense on the, on the cost of capital is 300 billion total. Uh, uh, if you have a $5 billion, $5 trillion budget, 70% on uh, autopilot, it's interest expense and entitlements. So you've only got a trillion five discretionary spending. This is all rough numbers. The so three hundred billion increase is a pretty big number. Um, I think total. I remember doing this calculation a couple of months ago. I think the average and the average cost of, of, of debt for the U.S. government's about I think it's one point two four percent or something like that. So 
I don't know, Marty, Bobby J, you want to have a go at that? Yeah, I, I would just say that everything that uh, George, you just said is right on. Uh, the, you know, those are the cold, hard numbers. <clears throat> and um, I think it's been uh, the argument of uh, among the arguments of those who are saying, well, the, the Fed can't possibly raise rates uh, for exactly that reason. They, uh, you know, that's not part of the official Fed mandate. You know, the, the mandate is uh, maintain stable prices consistent with full employment, which is a good trick to achieve, uh, you know, before you bring in, well, don't tank the financial markets, don't make exports more difficult by uh, high interest rates that cause the dollar to be strong. Now you throw in on top of that, don't uh, exacerbate the deficits by raising the cost of borrowing to the government. There's really more than uh, uh, that the Fed can handle, but uh, it's certainly, and, and again, it's not anything the Fed talks about publicly, but there's certainly been uh, suspicion that behind the scenes, uh, you've had people from Treasury and, uh, and more importantly from the, uh, the administration, elsewhere in the administration, saying, um, uh, you know, don't, don't create a headache for us by uh, uh, worsening the deficit uh, through this, uh, uh, this, this other, uh, uh, method. Right. And, and it, so, so Mari, just a follow up. So when I was talking before about what, you know, the fed, they're, they're, they're talking the talk, but let's see if they're going to walk the walk mm-hmm. So far. They've been engaging in open mouth operation. They haven't really done anything yet. And as Bobby J always says, I love his analogy. It's like in basketball, watch the hips, you know, watch, <laughs> watch what they do, not what they say. Now, a cynic, a conspiracy theorist such as you is truly, from the dark side will say it's all bullshit. They're doing this because for political reasons. If it wasn't for the fact that Obama, that uh, Biden's poll ratings are plummeting, they wouldn't care. But it's become a problem. They're also, to the extent they've got a very sort of left view of things, inequality is a big deal. So the lowest 40% of the socioeconomic strata are getting whacked by this. But a cynic would say, you know what? You're talking tough about inflation, but uh-uh. think about it. You got all this debt, 30 trillion of government debt, 250 trillion of unfunded liabilities. It, it, it's, it's, it's getting out of control. There's only two ways you can rein this in. One, you have a great reset. You have El Bustamundo. You have a bankruptcy. Well, that ain't, they ain't going to do that. that. That can't happen. So the other one is devalue the debt. You know, just debase the debt. Debt is nominal. Income active uh, GDP is real. So as long as debt is growing at a, a pace slower than nominal GDP, you're okay. In other words, inflate away the debt. So to what extent do you have any uh, time for the sort of conspiracy, the- conspiracy theorist view, view of what's going on? Well, uh, I, I, I don't think this is the wackiest <laughs> one out there by a long shot. <laughs> and, uh, um, and, you know, it, we, we certainly have the historical precedent. Um, the, probably the most notorious was uh, the UK. Um, uh, uh, you know, did pretty explicitly uh, devalue uh, their debt. Uh, you know, this goes back many years. But um, it's not... Um, uh, not by any means uh, out of the question. Uh, there are you know, limited uh, possible solutions, all of them bad, but uh, politically uh, and you know, perhaps even economically, that may wind up being uh, the least bad. Um, now, the, it's um, uh, certainly going to hit savers very hard. They are a constituency, maybe not the ones that uh, politicians are listening to the most, but they have some voice. Uh, ideally, you'd like to, you know, the um, you know, politician is famous for saying, you know, in response to the question, what's your favorite color, plaid. And uh, so you'd like to make everybody happy if you could, but uh, if you're going to have someone take the hit, maybe it is going to be the savers and um uh so th- it's um 
yeah, I, I, I let's say it's, it's it's just you know it's not a it's not something totally concocted. You know, say well out of nowhere we've come up with this conspiracy theory. It's uh, looking at this riddle and saying what's the escape route from the predicament that we're in. And yeah, you know, like I say, there are only a limited number of choices. Yeah, it may be the least bad one. All right, let's go to uh, Kevin and then Robert. What's up, Kevin? Uh, hey, George. Thanks for having me on. My question uh, for Marty is, uh, as you pointed out at the beginning of the talk, uh, the long run average on the option adjusted spread is about 130 basis points higher it is than it is now. And I would suggest that we're living in a world where, in theory, uh, that spread should be above that long run average as opposed to below it. And so my question essentially is, how much of this do you think is driven just by sheer supply and demand dynamics, as in pension funds or balanced funds uh, and their needs just for the amount of product that exists out there? How much of this do you feel uh, is just driven by a lack of product? Uh, well, that is a, a factor. Um, one complication in it is that the issuers can um, – uh, finance either in the uh, high yield bond market or the loan market. So, uh, to some extent, the uh, supply uh, in the bond in the high yield bond market is affected by the relative uh, attraction. And I actually do an analysis of that, uh, which compares loans and bonds on uh, uh, with a methodology I call equalized ratings mix. Because if you just look at the you know, nominal comparison between the two yields, it j uh, just tells you that, well, yeah, the, the mix of uh, ratings is different in the loan market than in the bond market. Um, so, uh, and I know that this methodology is uh, valid because when it uh, gets to the uh, point of, uh, you know, loans being uh uh, cheap uh, relative to bonds uh, at an extreme, the issuance goes the other way because the issuers, of course, always pick what's least attractive to the investor. Um, so, uh, but anyway, the as far as, far as the, the supply goes, you know, as say companies have funded out their debt, um, the uh, I, I think that there is some constraint. You've, of course, you've seen a, a, a huge volume of debt repurchase in uh, the corporate America in the last few years. And um, now you might uh, you might fund that with debt. So that would add to supply. Um, but it's, um, you know, you know, it's driven you know, energy being one example we talked about earlier where they haven't been investing a lot, uh, you know, for the reasons that we talked about. So, um, yeah, supply and demand is, is certainly is uh, critical. Uh, the, uh, inve the investors need to uh, uh, put the money to work that, that uh, they have coming in. And, um, uh, you, know, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the investors at the end um, have to generate yield regardless of, um, you know, what's available, they have to uh, get the most yield they can. So um, the, uh, the high yield market benefits from that in, in the supply, from the supply of capital side, because uh, when investors can't get the yields that they need uh, for actuarial purposes, in the case of uh, some of the institutional investors or just individuals who are De uh, dependent on the income, uh, they are have no choice but to lower their uh, risk standards and say, well, we'll have to go into below investment grade corporate bonds, even though our natural habitat might be uh, investment grade corporates or mortgage backs or you know even uh, even treasury bonds. We just can't get the yield there. So uh, right. that that v definitely has a uh, a very big impact on where the, the spread will be. Michael Howell, who's a friend of this room, is in here all the time. He's spoken about this price insensitive buying. A lot of times asset managers just buying fixed income to uh, 
neutralize you know liabilities and so yours is a real thing i agree with that and i would just make a more general point that, that you made so much money got put into the freaking system it pushed up the price of everything price of equities price of bonds price of commodities houses baseball cards everything and i, I mentioned bonds as one of them i mean everything is overpriced or exp- in, in a historical context and, and i just refer you know, we had we had sort of maximum monetary policy. You know, we, we had we had maximum bond prices, maximum investor investor sentiment, maximum valuation, maximum Marshallian K. I mean, we just overcooked the thing. Yeah, the I mean, is, the system is now in the process of normalizing, and that's going to give you lower bond prices, higher yields, lower stock prices, eventually lower real estate prices, eventually lower collectible prices. I mean, it's just overcooked. And so to your point about, yeah, there's this price insensitive buyer out there, but even that, to the extent that there are price sensitive buyers, I mean, think about it. If you're, if you're the Japanese or uh, the Chinese or, you know, forget about what we just did to the global financial system and maybe nobody wants to sell dollars anymore. It's a whole other story. But all things being equal, when you stop and think that, you know, what the budget steps is going to be, and then you add on the fact, the idea that if the Fed is seriously goes toward what they said they were going to do, that they're going to go from, you know, being a buyer of whatever they were, five hundred billion or, or, or a trillion a year, to a seller of a trillion a year, and they want to, you know, sell three trillion over three years, which I don't think they can do. They'll break the thing. I mean, think about it. if you're if you're if you're a sovereign nation and you've been you've got you know, U.S. Treasuries have been a home or repository for uh, your savings, and you see this wall of supply come right now. It'd be like, hello, let's just step away. And I think that's what is happening because we have a real problem here. I mean, the foreigners don't buy our paper anymore. The government, the Fed was buying all our stuff. Now they're supposed to be sellers. Who knows if they'll go through with it. So if you have to, so yeah, your, your price insensitive buyers, the guys that are trying to satisfy liabilities, they're still there. I agree with that. But the problem is the other buyers are standing aside. And that's why I think rate, I think supply and demand. So I think rates are going up, going up a hell of a lot. Not just to mention the whole inflation boogeyman. So, I don't know. Well, I hope that answers your, your question, Kevin. Well, I, I would actually add something to that. Marty touched on it a little bit there, and that is this increasing hunt for yield. And I think that, uh, you know, as you rightly point out, everything's got too expensive. But what I'm curious about, too, uh, as a guy who was managing a bond portfolio at the time of the credit crisis, um, you know, I mean, the, the, the leverage at that time was absolutely insane. Um, I don't really need to tell many people about that. I'm curious as to to what extent we're seeing that again. I mean, I know the CLO markets become, um, I guess, much more wide open over the last couple of years. I don't know to what extent, as a guy who doesn't have eyeballs on it anymore, I don't know to what extent CDOs are a thing again. But, I mean, the grander point is if if – you know, if you've got, for example, as a pension fund, and I'm sure there's some people on here that could probably speak to this more than I can, but let's say that you have, um, as a fixed income manager, you've got, you know, or as a pension fund as a whole, that you've got uh, liabilities that are running at 8% a year, for example, and you're looking around and hunting for yield and ways to pay uh, for those liabilities. I mean, it, it's forcing the hand of people. It's forcing people to take on increased leverage to structure products that, that increase that leverage. And I mean, my grand concern, and you pointed this out earlier too, um, you know, talking about the Fed going until something breaks. Well, I can tell you right now that the thing that the Fed is going to be concerned about isn't the equity market. It's the credit market. Kevin, 100%, 100%. You want to know something? You know where I think this is going to break? I think it's the fucking government bond market because that's where the excess is. And what I mean, what I mean, break is that I think you're going to see a discontinuity in bond prices. That's what's going to break. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, to your point earlier um, about the fact that it's really a bunch of job owning to this point. I've tried to point out to people that inflation suits the Fed right now, and it, it suits them up to a certain point. Right? I, they're going to slow roll this thing as hard as they can. Um, and that's because, you know, the size of the debt, you really only have two ways out, right? One is, is you've either got to erode it through inflation, 
or you're going to wind up inevitably defaulting on it. And, um, you know, your point is obviously door number two, um, but door number one, uh, to the extent that, that, you know, they're still trying to not necessarily push the transitory narrative, but they are trying to walk the transitory line. And, uh, yeah, but, but Kevin, I don't interrupt you because that's bullshit. Not your bullshit. Their bullshit. Okay. You go oh, back sure. and read. There was a quote the other day. I think I tweeted. It, I can't remember who it was from. The idea that they're somehow going to soft land this thing, like it's like Goldilocks, like not too hot, not too cold. That's just not going to happen. No, it's just not no. going to happen. That is no. CNBC think stockbroker economics of highest <laughs> order. All right, Kevin, you stay up on stage. I want to come back to more questions, but I want to get some other people in here. Um, sure. j- j- just stay there. I like your questions. Uh, Robert, do you have a quick follow-up before we go to somebody else? Robert, do you have a quick follow-up? Robert? Me? No. No, no. Ro- Ro- yeah. Ro- Robert T., do you have a Thank quick follow-up? Um, yeah, I just had a question uh, regarding the difference in the performance between high yield and investment grade recently in the recent sell-off. It's kind of striking that high yield is outperforming and i wonder what you attribute this to because i know part of it is energy but actually if you look at all the sectors all sectors in high yield have been outperforming their investment grade counterparts and i was wondering where do you see this going forward and do you think that's the market kind of telling us that there isn't much of a default risk uh with with high yield outperforming investment grade and that it's more of a yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Marty, Bobby? Well, Marty, I, Lisa, I, I would say that, uh, <clears throat> that that's one of uh, several anomalies we've uh, seen in the last several months. Um, the, uh, yeah, the, the, some of the traditional relationships between risk and reward seem to have been suspended. Um, now, the if you're talking about high yield, versus investment grade corporates, the indexes uh, do have a significant difference in duration, um, you, know, you know, in other words, sensitivity to interest rate moves because of longer average maturities and lower yields, those all, uh, and lower coupons all contribute to uh, greater uh, interest rate sensitivity. So it's not totally anomalous that you would see uh, more of a negative price movement in the investment grade corporates in response to the rise in interest rates at a time when we haven't seen a lot more uh, concern about default risk. We still have a very low level of bonds you know, trading at distressed levels. You know, you could have the spreads where they are now or you know, uh, somewhat wider with a significantly higher component of distressed issues and still averaging out. Uh, but the market is saying um, th- you, you really are, are not going to see a lot of defaults over the next 12 months. The market could, uh, the high yield market, the market could wind up being wrong about that, but um, that's where it is right now. And so the interest rate factor has been uh, more significant uh, you know, since the, the start of the year. That, 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 that's awesome, Marty. Thanks. And by the way, it just goes back to, again, of course, I'm searching for the uh, piece of evidence that'll, that'll fit my narrative. The idea that rates can go up a lot more and something's, it's going to take a lot longer before something breaks. And so the longer those spreads remain well behaved, higher rates are going to go. And goodbye PE ratio for Kathy Woods. This is going to be fun. We're not done with you yet. <laughs> I, got, I got a bid in at $30. Okay, we're not done with you. And this is what this is what the stock market guys don't understand. Anyway, all right. So hold on. Before we go any further, before we go any further, ladies and gentlemen, we have crossed fifty thousand dollars. Yeah. If we get if we get five hundred more grants, kicking in two thousand. So I need you guys to, you know, as uh, Ed Beal in, uh, <laughs> in Network, I need you to stand up and reach into your pockets. Um. 500 will get us 2000 so a lot of you have already given generously um so you know those who haven't if you're getting value from this room please pay forward i mean i think this is wonderful it is a privilege to have marty and bobby j in this room as bobby would saying you know normal folk don't get access to people like marty marty is doing this just to help us to educate us 
And I kind of think he's probably enjoying it, despite the fact I throw a lot of crap at him. or not, at <laughs> but, but at least past him. But Marty knows I never ask easy questions. All right, so let's move on here. So uh, let's go to um, uh, Mr. Newman. Good to see you, man. What's up? Hey, everybody. How are you? So I just want to say, Marty, uh, I worked at Merrill in the 90s and in Japan and then a couple years in uh, the OOs. And it was, you know, this is legendary to have you here. And I'm really, uh, really glad George got you here. And it was you and Harley Bassman were the ones that taught us equity derivative guys. Like all we all we know about that whole side of the world. And so it's really uh, amazing to have you here. My question is this. Okay. Japan forever focused their policies more on the asset holders and those people than the economy itself paving rivers, et cetera, in the, in, in one glide path, right? The death by sandpaper situation is, is what caused that because of the short termism in the, in the concept of asset prices over the economy in terms of policy. Now, I wonder on that sort of glide path here, if the fed ends up really taking that policy, right? Where they're just, yeah, we really care about the economy, but we really care about the assets supporting it. How would you see that in your world if that were to be the glide path versus, let's say, something more dramatic, as George suggests, with the collapse of the bond market? Like, that's a whole other glide path, right? But I'm curious yep. what a death by sandpaper glide path by policy here would look like in your world. Because you already highlighted, right, the sort of disconnect of J&K and HYG, which sort of to me was them, them stopping in the bond world, buying their, buying all the paper, market getting ahead of that. But anyway... What do you think that looks like in, in, in a death by sandpaper world we could live in here in theory? Yeah, I think uh, we have some precedent for it. If you go back to the 90s, um, you know, the uh, I think we had an overly stimulated uh, Fed at that time. And it gave rise to mal investment. We had a profusion of telecom companies, which is not a problem in itself. Uh, it's just that, uh, you know, there was going to be a shakeout, clearly, and that's fine. Uh, that's happened in a lot of other, a lot of industries. Um, you have more companies created than wind up surviving over time. It's not wasteful. It's uh, competition. It's uh, people trying out different models and uh, seeing where the consumer markets settle out as to what the best model is, that's all fine. But that's that's fine if it happens in the private market, you know, in the venture capital world. The problem uh, that arises is that you have those companies going public. I, I remember uh, being at a luncheon uh, at a, a roadshow for a high yield uh, telecom deal. Uh, during the time I was at Merrill Lynch, and I wound up sitting next to the uh, CEO of the company uh, during lunch before the, the presentation started. And uh, he mentioned that he had just returned from Singapore. And I said, well, um, what was going on there? He said, well, we, we, we were doing an equity offering, but then we heard there was a great financing window in the high yield market. And this was in zero coupon bonds, which aren't much of a picture part of the picture these days, but it was uh, such a good uh, deal, meaning that uh, the the market was so overpriced uh, from the standpoint of the investor, meaning a great bargain for the issuer. He said that, well, we canceled the equity offering and came back here and got this uh, high yield bond offering going. So that to me was a pretty strong signal that uh, things were out of whack. And that's what we're likely to see again. You know, it so happened that that industry and in the equity market, the Internet was coming along at that point. But if it hadn't been those industries, it would have been something else. Uh, the entrepreneurs and uh, bankers would have found some other way to you know, basically flush that money down the toilet, uh, uh, but earn uh, great fees along the way. And um, so we sort of know the answer to your question. We don't know exactly which industry, exactly what form it'll take. But I think malinvestment is the key with very severe losses to investors down the road. Well, Mar Marty, I think we're, I mean, we're, we're I think we're getting it. I mean, the malinvestment. I mean, yep. 
does the world really need more fucking food? Excuse my French. I just guess this is a hot button for me. I'll try, I'll try to be polite. Does no, the world really need? Does Sorry, George, really I bring that out of you. Like, Sorry, pal. I know, you, Mark. I'm triggered by you. You're 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 a middle aged white Caucasian male. You trigger me. Okay. Um, okay. Does the world really need you know goddamn food delivery apps on twenty times sales? You know, does the world need freaking you know social media apps for dating? I mean. Like, look at we're pissing the money down the rat hole on. This is bullshit. It's a bit of a zombie land. And, and that totally. is Japan. Japan became zombie land, man. Totally. This is, all, yeah. this, is all, this is all bullshit. I mean, you know what? You know what? Mark, you know this. You know, people talk about productivity, health, productivity, blah, blah, blah. What they fail to, that they know about, but they really don't talk about enough is like, like multi factor productivity. It's not just, you know, you know output per, per, per hour worked. But how about output per like billions of dollars poured down a rat hole? All right. Marty's totally right. This is malinvestment on steroids. This is all garbage. All right. You take a look by comparison. Look at what the Chinese are investing in where they fucking make things. All right. This is a goddamn joke. You want to know something? You want to know something? I think the stock market crash. I'm really channeling my inner Mort Downey Jr. here now. You got me going. Or, or is it Jerry Springer? I think a, a stock market crash would be good for the economy. And you know why? We got to stop this goddamn misallocation. That's the problem. All right. This is all bullshit. We don't make things anymore. All right. And the problem is, you know, we all know, for instance, we have an infrastructure deficit in this country. All right. The roads, the railroads, everything. All right. How about some companies raising capital for things, for real things? All right. Not the bullshit vaporware, Kathy Wood narrative garbage. All right. That is the problem with this economy. That is the problem with this stock market. All right. We need a stock market crash. Mark, is there anything you don't understand about that? <laughs> I hear you. Well said, George. <laughs> I'm sorry, I got it. You, you know, you know, I'm it's coming from a good place. You know what I'm. You know what I mean. And everyone yeah. in this room knows exactly what I mean. Anyway, hey Jackson, you got You have to talk, otherwise I'm gonna go totally nuts. Jackson, the floor is yours. I got your back, and I just wanted to throw a bone at Marty and Bobby J. Again, it goes back to what George was just talking about. Real versus nominal. It's frustrating me to tears. I mean, we're seeing so many people pile into crap that is nominal gains. They're not managing their book. And again, what do we see? Real versus nominal and then the pouting. So again, it's 100% all in. 100%. And, and Jackson, you and I talked about it. We look at the world with similar lens. It's this fake it till you make it bullshit economy. All right. And you know what? None of it's real. It's all virtual. And I and by the way, and my crypto friends, they're going to get destroyed too. All right. Because listen, all this stuff is being done in a world where the cost of money is zero. All right. And if you had de dis disinflation or deflation in certain asset classes, you wanted by definition, if you had an asset light model, you don't want the depreciation of owning real assets. But in a world of inflation, where those assets are going up in value, a real company has far more value than a virtual bullshit company. I'm sorry, I'm really triggered here now. And, 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 New, and Newman did it to me. 100%. And you know where I'm coming from because I'm driving you nuts all day, every day with this top line bullshit. I want some bottom yeah. line gains. Yeah, but, but Jackson, you know if you can get free money, you can fake it till you make it. That's the whole Tesla model or all these guys, all right? They, 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 you know, if you sell dollar bills for 80 cents, I promise you, you can dro 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 drive your top line, right? But the way you make up the losses is through free money for capital markets. That game is over. It's over. All right, enough. George, Marty, yeah, question sorry. for Marty. Yeah, so, sorry, Marty, you going to say something? Marty? No, 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 no. I think you, uh, you covered that very, uh, very well. Yeah. You were gonna, um, I, I know hey, you George. want to say it. I know you were going to say Marty eloquently, but you kind of like for coffee. Uh, there. Oh. Marty, bear in mind that I did ask George to tone it down. He did uh, for your <laughs> benefit. So I did, I did, but then, but then, but those, but then that the questions are. I, I'm not talking no, to no, Marty. No, he toned it down. He has. I was nice. I was nice. Okay, but Newman yeah. did. But I have everybody, a question. I no, have a everybody question. in this room knows it's Newman's fault. All right, George, Thank I have you. a comment. So uh, in Marty's book, Financial Statement Analysis, he talks about the adversarial nature of financial reporting, something you've talked about, George, accounting, gap, et cetera. Marty, why don't you just touch on what you mean by the adversarial 
relationship of financial reporting for everybody. And if you don't have financial statement analysis, you're not a serious investor. Go ahead, Marty. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Bob. Uh, yeah, I, the basic idea of it is that if you read most books on accounting, uh, financial analysis, yeah, they start off by saying that the purpose of financial reporting is to hold up a mirror to the company and uh, explain to investors what's there. I, this is totally wrong. Uh, from the company standpoint, the purpose of financial reporting is to minimize their cost of capital. So anything within the bounds of gap, uh, sometimes beyond, uh, although we have had a reduction since uh, Sarbanes-Oxley and outright financial reporting fraud, but uh, companies still push the limits as much as they possibly can and are always looking for new gimmicks. So what they're trying to do is to present an un unreal picture of uh, their earning power, their balance sheet strength, their cash flow generation, which cash flow is harder to fake, but they um, come up with some other ways, you know, kind of to steer you toward other measures. And it really is a game between the investors who are trying to get a real picture, a real understanding of what's going on, and companies doing everything they can to conceal it. There was for a long time uh, uh, re resistance to the idea of segment reporting. Um, and uh, well, when they, they said, all right, well, we have to report by segments, let's lump together totally unrelated businesses into a so-called segment to keep things as opaque as possible. And uh, again, I, I, there may be uh, listeners, maybe not on this show, but I think on others who might say, oh, this, this is so cynical and uh, this guy's casting aspersions. I, I, I can tell you that in, in many years of looking at this and since the uh, first edition of that book came out, uh, it, it's only reinforced that uh, this is what companies are about. They are not, uh, about trying to uh, give you an honest picture of what's going on. Um, so it's a cat and mouse game, as Howard Marks, who was kind enough to provide a uh, blurb for the dust jacket on the new edition, said it's a cat and mouse game between the investors trying to find out what's really going on and companies trying to disguise when something goes bad, uh, deferring uh, expenses to the next um, quarter, um, accelerating revenues to the present quarter by offering uh, incentives to their uh, distributors that are not economically justified, but have this cosmetic effect of look, making the current quarter uh, look better than it, than it really was, and then hoping to make it up uh, later on. Uh, so that's, you know, those are a few examples of the kind of things that go on, but it, it is very much uh, a, a, ad, a adversarial as opposed to let's work together. We'll give you an uh, accurate picture and you can supply to us capital at a rate that reflects uh, th what's you know, the, the true risk in, uh, in our company. And by the way, uh, George, you'll be happy to know that in Marty's 2011 edition, he uses an example of one of your heroes, Michael Saylor and MicroStrategy. Marty, Marty, we have to have lunch. It's been too long since we met. This is, <laughs> this is I, I, I love you, man. All right, listen, we've been going for two hours and twenty minutes. We're coming down to the last five minutes. I have one thing to say first. We're gonna go. We're gonna go to uh, Carpathia in a second. But um, I, I'm exciting news. Just want to let you guys know it's working. It's happening. We have raised twenty seven hundred dollars in this room today. So now we're gonna make Grant pay up. Grant put down the challenge of two grand, so we're now going to be up to like fifty two thousand seven hundred. So this room will have raised about forty seven hundred. Uh, if you haven't given yet, and you can spare a few dollars, maybe we can get us up to five thousand dollars for the room today. We're at forty seven hundred. I think we raised like I don't know ten or twelve the first room, nine thousand the second room, and so it's happening. And um, you know our goal is two hundred. So bravo to all of you. Uh, this is fabulous. Everyone's learning here. This is unbelievable. I'm learning. You know, Marty, Bobby, I can't thank you enough. This has been phenomenal. So anyway, well done, well done, room and Grant. We know where you live, so pay up, dude. <laughs> Carpathia, the floor is yours. Go for it. 
I'll keep it real tight. I just got to towel my phone and face off after that rant. Okay, I'm ready. Um, is there any value in looking? Is the currency going to win or is Corota going to win on his tenure at 25 basis points? And I'm taking that to the next step. Georgia just sent you a overlay from the last five years of the yen and the VIX. Uh, anyone want to comment on that? I'd greatly appreciate it because I'm watching that. And I don't think it's an accident that the yen's uh, plumbing. Well, as I'll, he's... I'll let Marty and Bobby go first, and I definitely have an answer on that. Thank you, guys. Yeah, Bob, do you want to start it off here? I... And no, I, 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 you guys are more knowledgeable about uh, yen than, uh, than I would be, so I'll pass. Yeah, I... I would say, well, George, if you have some comments on it, I, I think, you know, you, uh, you probably uh, you know, more focused on it than I, than I am to tell you the truth. All right. That, that, that's fair. So Carpathia, hundred percent. So uh, Michael Howell, who we all love is a friend of this room, who um, I um, known for decades, the world's foremost expert in uh, liquidity. He always talks about how volatility starts in the fixed income markets or, and then goes to the currency markets the other way around and then it goes to the equity markets. So 100%, there's an earthquake occurring in Japan right now. And this is and it's a tsunami in their capital markets. And this is important because this is the world's was the biggest or second biggest creditor country in the entire world. So I think we touched on this earlier earlier in the, in, in the room. But this is huge, absolutely huge. So they're going to have a choice here. As you Carpathia rightly said, or is that a question? You can you can you, you can fix your bond market or you can fix your, your currency. You can't do both. So they got a choice. And I believe that the you know there's a lot of reasons why yields in the, in the state in, in the US have been going up. The fact that bond yields in Japan have been rising is one of the key determinants of it. And oh, by the way, oh by the way, lest you not you, Carpathia, but the room just think, oh, it's just, you know. It's just Japanese bond yields. Who really cares? It doesn't matter. Blah, blah, blah. Well, well, the Japanese yen has now gone to a 20-year low. So let's say you're Xi Jinping, and you're the Chinese, and there are some markets you're competing in with the Japanese. And all of a sudden, your, big, your trade rival has had a 20% off sale. Gee, what does that do to your competitiveness? Gee, maybe what would, what would that make you want to do to your currency? So, you know, it's like dominoes. So, no, this is all about volatility. This all gets filed under the heading of volatility in the regime that we're in. We have entered. We will be in a, a regime of much higher volatility. You've heard me say it before. Goldilocks is dead. Goldilocks is dead. You want to talk to me about a recession? You want to talk to me about Weimar? And everything in between except Goldilocks. I do not. Goldilocks is dead. She's not coming back. And this whole disinflationary bullshit, slow growth, Goldilocks. And I'm going to have to let Jackson weigh in on this. Um, that is not going to happen. And that's what Kathy Woods needs to live. We kill Goldilocks. We kill Kathy Woods. Jackson, you? Goldilocks is 100% dead. I was looking for KFAB trying to get him to chime in. Because we've been talking about this yen volatility, and you're absolutely right, George. It is incomprehensible. The JGBs, I mean, there are moves that, you know, again, I'm I'm nowhere near as experienced as you guys, but we're talking 20-plus years in these markets and seeing moves that are unprecedented. You know, and the incredible thing is, I think you're living up very well said, Jackson. I feel like I live in a parallel universe. you got this stuff going on. It's obvious to you and Carpathia and, and, Mar and Marty and Bobby. Anyone's paying attention to the big picture. And meanwhile, you have these talking heads on CNBC breathlessly talking about the Lucid Order book or the Rivian Order book. I mean, you know, these things are on 30 times revenues. They don't even have sales. It's like, what freaking planet are these people on? I want to shoot myself in the face. I mean, it's unbelievable. All right. So, Mar Marty, one question I have to ask you before we go. And again, I can't thank you enough, but it was a really good question. One of the uh, one of our listeners sent in. It was a direct message. They wanted to know, and Bobby or 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 or, or Marty, is there a book or two that you know a readable book? I'm not talking about put you to sleep book. Is there a book or two or a reference that you would suggest um, that people read 
they want to just learn more about bond markets aside from your own but are there any are there any sort of like more elementary books because realize it is pretty wonky heavy stuff but people want to learn more about credit more about bonds are there any one or two books in particular that you would point to yeah I, well i think the the best thing is to just go on uh, amazon or another uh seller and um put in the name fabozzi that's f a b o z z i frank fabozzi and he's got i don't uh, recall the title of the one that uh, right off the hand that's uh, it, that is but that's the one i recommended when i've had that question come in from others um it's, it'll, it'll be clear which is the book you know of his many books that's uh, you know an introduction lays out the basics of the bond market and he is really outstanding at explaining things um just i i'll tell you just a quick anecdote there's a program that the chartered financial analyst uh institute runs every year in um uh in the chicago area and i used to be on the board of that program so i used to go every year and hear them and uh the speakers were uh rated on a four point scale um and uh, if you got if, if you got anything in the threes, you were doing pretty well. You know, three point two or something like that. You were doing really well. Uh, the almost all of the attendees were equity specialists. You know, mid mid level kind of equity practitioners. Uh, Frank Flubosi talked about mortgage backed securities, uh, which is a topic that uh, is full of all kinds of jargon that. Uh, only people who trade mortgage-backed securities can possibly understand. Fabozzi, I called him the Ty Cobb of the Financial Analyst Seminar because he was always, you know, in the 360, 380 kind of a range, you know, head and shoulders above uh, any other presenter with the most difficult topic given the audience. But he was able to explain things without resorting to all that jargon, showing that it was really common sense when you uh, looked at how things actually work. So he is really uh, a, a, a genius in that, uh, that you know, uh, ability to explain things to a general reader. So let's like say just look up for Bozy on a bookseller site and uh, you'll, you'll be in good hands. Marty, that's have the... some other uh, recommendations. I don't know. Yeah, uh, yeah. Marty, you know what? Maybe, uh, I don't know. I, I don't think he'd be the world's foremost twi- tweeter, but if you can send to me or to Bobby J some other books, okay, uh, I, I, I will tweet them out. Um, okay. By the way, Marty, I, I just want to know. I'm teasing you, Marty. This is an attempt to humor. Bad joke warning coming here. <laughs> so, like, Marty, like, would you sort of? I mean, you know, at least like if you're here for stock guy, you can you can you can trade in narratives and great stories and bullshit. You know, Elon Musk this and you know. The greatest jerk can answer that, right? But like, so like, if I was single and young, like I could tell stories, and I'm a pretty good bullshit artist. You figure that out, okay? Everyone knows that. But like, and this is for you, Bobby J, as well. So, like, if you meet an interesting woman in a bar, and like, you want to start talking about yield curves or convexity or swaptions, like, how does that work? <laughs> <laughs> well. Uh... You know, I, 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 I could tell you from in, in my own experience, I when I was uh, you know, dating my wife, um, we went to a, uh, a, a gathering that included some bond traders. And this was only you know, corporates, not, you know, mortgage backs were really just in their infancy at that time. And um, she, she came back saying, they were just talking all about the twos of 2020 and the threes of you know 2014. What was that all about? You know, it, yeah, it was totally incomprehensible. So yeah, it's not the best way to start a line of chat to uh, talk shop if you're in the singles market. I'm I I, I consider myself uh, fortunate that I've been out of that market for a long, long time. The reason I jest, you can think about it, Marty. You you had you'll probably have when it's all said. I mean, we had I don't know, probably there's only like three or four hundred people left in here. We had as many as six hundred at one point. Mm-hmm. Probably be two thousand people all in. My guess is you'll probably have fifteen thousand people listening, having listened to you. Wow. Well, we'll, we'll have to redact the f bombs from yours truly. But you know, <laughs> we really are indebted to you. This has been wonderful, Bobby. I can't thank you enough. This has been awesome, and I hope you'll come back again. And next time, I won't be so triggered. Hopefully, new one won't be here. But at any rate, I mean, I want to thank everybody in the room. This has been absolutely phenomenal. You guys killed it. 
Um, you know, as far as World Central Charity is concerned, Grant Grant paid up. He's a man of his word. So um, this has just been unbelievable. You know, it's building, but we got momentum. I'm trying to get this uh, uh, crazy crypto debate going. I'm trying to get Michael Saylor to to come on and debate me, and, and, and with all the proceeds going to charity. And whoever wants to buy the rights to the popcorn franchise, it's probably a good investment. But um, we've raised here, you know, today I think about five thousand dollars. This is awesome. We learned a lot, Marty. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Um, one one well, thing, George. Yeah, just, go ahead. Go for uh, it. Uh, Marty does the newsletter. And yep. um, I, I follow it and I've um, bought some um, securities that are uh, suggested or just profiled in that newsletter. It's a good uh, way of getting yield in a, in a rising rate environment. That's awesome. So, so, and, so, 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 quality, yeah, so, so, so Bobby or Forbes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bobby or Marty, uh, how can we fi- how can we find your newsletter if we want to subscribe to it, please? <clears throat> yeah, the uh, yeah, it's called the Income Securities Investor. And you can find it at uh, you put put in uh, https uh, colon uh, forward slash forward slash. But the uh, URL is www.isinewsletter.com. So one all one word isi for income securities investor newsletter. All right, and, and, and Marty and Bobby, if you could just send me an info, I'll be sure to tweet it out so people can find it more readily. I, oh, thank let, you. I, I'm not sure Marty's Twitter following is going to have much pull here, but anyway, um, let, 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 we can use, I don't know, I'm turning to a Twitter celebrity, but uh, Marty, please send that to me or send it to Bobby, and I, I will yeah. tweet it out because I think it sounds it sounds like we could, all, we could all benefit from it enormously. So, all right, listen, two and a half hours, longer than I thought it was going to be. Marty, it's your fault. You kept us all interested. Um <laughs> And, and, and let's do it again. And Bobby, I can't thank you enough again and everybody else. This is great. We've cracked the $50,000 mark in fundraising. Look forward to future rooms. We've got a lot of great speakers lined up. So the hits keep on coming. Take care, everybody. Good night. Marty, thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.